You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of The Bible for Normal People. And our topic today is teaching God to your kids. Yeah, I mean, nothing. Easy. Nothing. nothing. Easy peasy. And our guest yeah. is Matthew Paul Turner, who is a name I hope all of you know, or all of you will get to know pretty soon. He just writes the most amazing children's books, the most recent one of which is what is God like? Which is like the question, I think. Right. And and partners in that with Rachel Held Evans, the, right. the late Rachel Held Evans, who had put together some ideas for a children's book. And Matthew, who had close friends with Rachel, right. agreed to take that on as a project. And so, you know, we ben- we all benefit from that. Yes, from that uh, collaboration. collaboration. Right. right. Yeah. And we've, we've gotten to know Matthew a little bit first through the Evolving Faith Conference, of course, that Rachel set up. So it's, uh, it's just great to have him on because he really... He's so intentional about what he wants children to try to understand about God that produces joy and 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 healing mm-hmm. and not something that can unwittingly but but can cause real difficulties for kids when they get older and and I've seen that many many times uh, and, and, and it's not good I would say even for those of you who are listening who maybe who don't have children I think for me one of the the impacts of this episode and others that we've done has been to even just go back to my own childhood yes. and be able to forgive frankly some of those people in my life who did the best they could and maybe didn't have the resources that we're of now having now, but I just think it's still relevant for everyone to be right. able to listen to. Right. And, you know, if if you want, you know, we have a Patreon, we have a parenting channel on our, on our Slack group that meets, and people can talk about this stuff, and they do, because it's a good, safe place for people to say, listen, I'm just tired, and I don't know what to do, and anybody have any resources in this or that? So it's a really good place for people to process the very kinds of things we're talking about in this particular episode. Yeah, so if you're interested in that, you can just go to patreon.com front slash the Bible for normal people, or just listen to this episode. All right, folks, let's get to it. I don't want my kids to have to recover or go into therapy because of what I told them about God. God should be a a good part of their story, a hopeful part of their story, a healing part of their story. We need to stop approaching the stories that we tell our kids with fear. The one thing about parenting that I have learned is that all of my junk eventually comes out in how I parent. Well, welcome to the podcast, Matthew. It's great to have you. I am honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, to get started, just because of of the work you do, I think it'd be great for us to start with uh, just your spiritual biography. Like, bring us up to speed in your spiritual journey and what's led you to to end up writing books for kids. I've gone to church for as long as I can remember. But I went to an independent fundamental Baptist church as a kid. My help, my parents helped start the church. I had Barbies burned in front of me to explain hell. And so it was a <laughs> – you can they laugh. Do, they really do that. Yeah. No, they, they I, actually, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, my, my background, I'm thinking – I'm sitting here like, oh, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that, <laughs> it just went right by me. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 so, and so, like, I spent 14 years growing up in that kind of spiritual environment where everything was – it revolved around – you know, uh, hardcore connection to the King James Version of Scripture. Um, I went to the school, which was where all of the things that we learned in church kind of got mandated into rules by teachers and whatnot. And so, I, when I graduated, I, and, and I, I graduated, like, um, I was top of the class, and I was also, I got the pastor's award for being the most spiritual. And oh, so, probably. yeah. It was a real thing. Yeah. And so, I went to, you know, went off to college, uh, went away to college, and I had my Calvinism experience, you know, like... Yeah, you graduated. You graduated into Calvinism. Yeah, I did that um, for a little while, but it it really, um, my, my spirituality really started to mature when I started going to a, a USA Presbyterian church in Vienna, Virginia. I was, I had graduated from college. I had, you know, been out of college for a couple of years and I was managing a faith-based coffee house. And I it was the first time I got to be in a church experience where the rules were not the same as what I was raised in. And I started to evolve in the whole idea of becoming comfortable in not 
in in spirituality not looking exactly how it was like outlined for me for so long and like i just had you know spiritual i still had you know really vivid spiritual moments and it just and yet i the the rules weren't the same and so like it wasn't rigid and and so i i eventually moved to nashville became a an editor of a christian music magazine and i did that for 3 years and i had a absolute blast i absolutely loved it and when i left there one of the things that i realized about myself is that i had a no, I had a, a, a a knack for writing and I could put my personality down on paper pretty easily. And so I just kind of dove into writing books. And for the first 10 years, I, I wrote memoirs and, you know, uh, I wrote books about, you know, spiritual, uh, spiritual topics that, you know, of my spiritual journey. And, and it wasn't until uh, I had kids that, you know, when you start talking to them about God, I wanted to, I, I certainly wanted to introduce them to God in a way that was different than what I, how I was introduced to God. And when you start to... You know, Matthew, there are, to interrupt briefly, I know there are so many young parents out there who are saying exactly the same thing. They want to find a way to introduce God to their kids. That's very different from how, how it happened for them. So anyway, that's that just resonates, I know, with so, so many people. Anyway, go ahead. Absolutely. Like, I, I just, um, I would read books to my kids every night. And every time I, you know, I would read something that was spiritual in nature or Christian in nature, I would find myself editing in my head prior to actually reading it out loud, where the co- like the Bible, no, <laughs> well, it's like definitely the Bible. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, so I uh, I definitely would have those moments where I would you know be reading something and it would just you know it would have that weird transition where it would go from fun to some sort of theological truth, and I'm like, my kid is four, and I. I, yeah. it's just not ready for that. And um, so, do you mean like over their head or over their head? But uh, but but it, problematic. A, a too. Type, for me, problematic. I mean, maybe not for other people, but in the sense yeah. of like a a you know, my kids didn't grow up learning uh, learning the word sinner. Like it, I, like mm-hmm. my kids didn't grow up learning that um, that there was this uh, that God that God made them to be absolutely, you know, terrible human beings. Like, I, I, I've I, sort of kept them from that theology. And so, there, so often, children's books just have this, they lack joy. They lack excitement. And, and you know, like, and, and there are so many, be- and there are be- some beautiful children's books out there. But like you read, you read some of Max Lucado's books, and I love Max Lucado, but some of his children's books are, I mean, they'll, they'll put you, put you to sleep. And, and, and which I guess is good for you when you're reading to your kids <laughs> and, uh, for right. bedtime. But like, you know, my kids were way more interested in Llama Llama and way more interested in, you know, uh, all of the other books that I would read, you know, Where the Wild Things Are. And because there was, uh, they were alive and they, they rhymed or they had a rhythm to them. And, and so I, um, you know, in high school, I, I had a. I wanted to be a songwriter, and so I would carry around a notebook, and I was constantly writing poems and song lyrics, and and the one thing that I had, uh, you know, a talent for was just like putting things down on rhyme, and and I took finally took a moment and just decided, you know what, I'm going to see what I can do. Maybe this is a space. Maybe children's books is a space where I could fill a need if given a chance. And I just started writing one day and I, you know, about six, eight months later, I had, I had one idea. My, my agent took it to 11 publishers and all 11 of them said no. (laughs) A couple of them said no twice. And Mm. so I self published it and ended up selling every single copy of, of that book, which was called God made light. And then one of those publishers came back and 
said, hey, let's do this. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Can we talk again? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I, and, and my first book, When God Made You, took off. And I, it's connected with people in a way that yeah. I, I hoped, I mean, I hoped it would, but I, I had no idea to what degree people would connect to it. And, right. and, not, and not just parents of kids, but like people in their 20s who find it and read it to themselves and yeah, who were kids once. Right. right. And so, yeah. like, I, and, I, and I, you know, I realized in that process that I was, the, the, the process of writing children's books for me was, you know, I was rewriting my own narrative or reintroducing mm-hmm. God to myself and in the process introducing God in a beautiful, affirming, um, beautiful way to my kids and hopefully to other kids. Well, before we get into the books a little bit more, maybe especially your, your last one, What Is God Like? It, it was interesting to me how you were brought up, but then you never spoke to your kids about you know being a sinner <laughs> or things like that. So what, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the PCUSA, the, uh, the PCUSA church, but what happened with you? What, what brought you to that point where you just decided you needed to parent differently than you were brought up. Oh, I mean, that would, like, a lot happened, Pete. Like, I mean, <laughs> it was, life? you know, life. I mean, like, I, yeah. you start to go through the, you start to realize. Don't be snooty about No, it. no. <laughs> just asking a question. I'm just saying, I, I, like, I could talk for a long time about all of the toxic spirituality that I was presented as a kid, and how that affected every layer of my life. You know, when you're, when you're in, inside an independent fundamental Baptist church, it's not just a church experience, it's a life experience. It, it, yes. it, it yes. swallows you whole. And it's, you know, um, you know I, we, I experienced this in Maryland, which isn't known for its fundamentalism exactly. So we, we stuck out like sore thumbs, like we, and, which was just mm-hmm. what we wanted to do. Like that's exactly the goal. And so, I mean, it, and you don't realize all of the various layers of like um, the, the, the bigotries that you've learned within that kind of circle and the, right. the, the terrible like theologies that you just become a part of your life that you just assume are correct. And then you start, then you, you, you've learned this way of life. And then the first time I met an, a person who didn't believe in God was in, a, at a community college, my first semester. And I, 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 I went like fanatical on him. Like, I mean, I just was, I, I could mm. not believe that anyone could possibly not believe in God. Like even, I mean, you know, they may not believe in the exact God, but like, you know, so it was just like, it was culturally, I was culturally sheltered. I was, I, I grew up in a, in a, um, in a bubble. And so, and, 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 you know, in the meantime, every time I would take a step away from these experiences that are, are from my church experience as a child, it was a dramatic argument it, it, with my family, my family, you, you know, they, I remember the, in, when I went to Belmont University in Nashville, I, that was the first time I had, I ever visited a movie theater. And I remember my mom finding out that I had visited a movie theater. I think my sister told her and she called me up and she is crying. You would have thought that, you know, I had just done something absolutely terrible. And so, and, and that was, that became a common theme. Every step away was this big dramatic thing that happened. And so you, and you know, and then of course, like you go through the time in your life where your, your spirituality like becomes mixed with your political point of view and your cultural point of view. And, and then you start to see all those things just fall apart. And for me, like when I, I, I was one of those people who like fell hook, line and sinker for like George, Bo- George W. Bush's like compassionate conservative. Um, and I was like, wow, could, how, what a novel idea to add compassion to conservatism. I mean, it was just awesome to, in my mind. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I fell for that hook, line and sinker. And then Katrina happened and that, that changed me. 
Hmm. Watching the events unfold, watching the suffering, the, the people of color who were treated differently in the process of being rescued than the, the white people that were treated, and seeing how distant and non-compassionate all the things that I thought could be compassionate were, it really started a, it, it was a, I just, I, I, I literally like made a pretty vivid switch politically, spiritually. I, we, I, we, I, I started going to a different church. I left the church that I was in. And so, the, you know, certainly there were other facets that played into it all. But um, when, you know, I, two or three years later after 2005, it was when my first kid came into the world. And, you know, it's um, children, you, you have your first baby and you, like children tend to like make you think about all the things. And so I just never wanted him to experience the, dr- the drama and chaos of, uh, uh, that I had experienced in rela- and how it related to God. I just, is, and mm-hmm. so I, it, 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 it has become, it was a passion of mine then. And so I, I didn't think that I'd ever write children's books, you know, like it's, I mean, as a writer, I think there was, there, I flirted with the idea of like, oh, maybe I'll write a children's book one day, but I didn't have any, it wasn't, I, I kind of tripped into this and I, I have the idea of writing what I consider to be liturgy for kids and parents and people just needing good words spoken over them. Mm-hmm. It's um, it it is it's been so, it's been the most fulfilling writing I've ever done, and I and I'm just um I'm honored mm-hmm. to do it, and I take it very seriously, and it's um, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you talk about this transition that you went through, and and we of course we're the the Bible for normal people, but I think for a lot of people's religious experience in America, the Bible is sort of central for that. <laughs> so, how did your views on the Bible change and how, how does the Bible affect your views on God? And, and how does all that play into, you know, talking about, we, you know, we were joking earlier about having to translate in your head. And I have some of those experiences where it's like, well, I don't really want to say this, even though it's there in the Bible to my kids. Yeah. How does all that go together? You know, <laughs> I, um, you know, the, when I, as a kid, I thought, I thought of the Bible as a history book. A, a science book, a, a book that just encompassed everything. You know, we were taught that if there was a question about life, there was going to be an answer in the Bible. So, like, I was, um, and we also, like, held the view that there was something spiritually significant about the King James Version and the, uh, and if, and if our Bibles didn't contain the word or the, uh, the, the content AV 1611, which is, stands for authorized version. Like if those two mm-hmm. things weren't on our Bibles, they were not, they were not like real. And because we believed in some fashion that in, you know, when, you know, the King James, you know, commissioned the Bible to be translated into English, that, that the Holy Spirit came back and, and reinterpreted it. And I mean, we believed that where, like, we didn't even think about like the original transcripts, but like at, you know, eventually when we, when I was aware that there were original transcripts, we like where those, where the King James version differed from those transcripts, it was the transcripts that should have been changed is how Mm. I was taught. And so, Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it took me a long time to ever think about anything in scripture as you you know um different than what i had been raised i mean i think i i had moments where i certainly hoped it was different because you know i just there were some things in the scripture that i didn't fully understand and so i i i think you know i, I think it's it's like you start to meet people you start to have conversations with people and people that you really spiritually respect and you, you find out that they're okay 
thinking of Adam and Eve as a as a uh, you know a a narrative that wasn't you know history, but it was you know it 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 gives us a glimpse of of what happens in in real life, um, but it's not you know it doesn't have to be an Adam and there doesn't have to be an Eve, and so um, you, you 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 those little things start to chip away at your rigid or if they started to chip away at my rigid point of view of scripture. And so, you know, I think for me as a parent, it was like, you know, I, I knew scripture by the time I was seven or eight. I mean, I could have recited, I could recite long passages of scripture. I could tell you, if I didn't know the Bible story, I could give you a pretty close retelling of any Bible story you asked me about. Hmm. And so... I just remember there was a, like a friend of mine was like, so what are you going to, what are you going to tell your kids about Noah's Ark? And <laughs> that kind of became the thing that like, am I going to, you know, like in my head, as I like thought about like that story being told, will I, you know, the, the question in my mind was, will I tell that story as like a historical event or will I tell that story as a, you know, uh, as an allegory and that, you know, that, that it's true on, on some level, but it's, uh, it's, it's not historically potentially what happened. And so I, and, and I'll tell you, I guess I'm at a place where I'm like, I'm very, I don't have to have, I, I, I don't have to have every little thing decided upon when it comes to the Bible. I mean, I still read my Bible. There's something that scripture, um, inspires out of me and it i've certainly it's inspired every single book on some level some of these some of the stories more than others and so i just uh i think that my my view of scripture has certainly evolved i i don't need everything to be be spelled out and make sense and fall in line yeah and you want and you want to find a way to model that or communicate that directly or indirectly to your children. Yes. So they don't have to process some of the same difficult things. I mean, you're talking about the, you know, the flood story and I've gone on and on about this in uh, other podcasts and stuff, but you know, what do you tell your children? Well, you don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm not <laughs> right, no, seriously, right? because I and, and here's the thing, this is not And I've been, I've yet to I've yet to tell that story. So that's, <laughs> that's Well, right, because everybody dies. You know, it's chapter 6 <laughs> of the Bible and God's out of ideas, right? Now, we can understand that from an ancient near eastern point of view, that story makes a certain amount of sense and you you can understand why people would tell that story. But the problem there, I think, is the uh, signals that children will get about what God is like. Mm-hmm. And you know, that leads me to the title <laughs> of, your, of your last book. I, I, mean, I thought know, that was think, intentional. <laughs> well, it is intentional. It is intentional yeah. because I think, I th- at the end of the day, tell me what you think about this. At the end of the day, I think what drives people to seek fresh ways of communicating their faith and the Christian faith to their children is that question of what God is like. That's, that's the central question. Hmm. That's what you want your kids to grow up with, thinking in a way that is life-giving and not makes you paranoid. And not makes and, – and, and, and I want – it's like I think, I, I think I've told – Jen Hapmaker once that I was like, I, I just, I want to, I, I don't want my kids to have to recover or go into yeah. therapy because of what I told them about God. And I think that is, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sometimes I feel like I'm just blazing, you know, blazing my own trail because I don't, I don't, I think, and I think a lot of people are, a lot of parents in my position feel that way. Like we, we want our kids to have a connection to God, but we want that connection to be healthy and happy and celebrate their humanity while also honoring some of the the traditions that I that you know that Christianity is is known for, and so I think that it's um my my hope is that my kids won't have to like 
write a memoir about their experience <laughs> growing up in church. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, on a, on a recent episode, my wife and I talked a little bit about parenting, and, and we challenged this idea that our kids need to grow up with this clear, black and white idea of God, or else it's going to sort of like scar them forever. So, there's this idea that we have to sort of raise our kids fundamentalists, and then, you know, we'll deconstruct with them when they're teenagers or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think that's not helpful at all. But in the, your most recent uh, book, you know, what is God like? You and Rachel talk a lot about mystery and asking questions. And so, can you talk more about that? Maybe even in your own parenting, or as you were writing this book, that gave you this idea of it's okay for kids to have mystery and it's okay for kids to ask questions. That's not some like detrimental part of their development. Well, first off, first off, I want to acknowledge that um, this book was Rachel's book. Rachel Held Evans. Um, put these ideas for children, like the last ideas that Rachel put together before she became sick um, were, was a handful of ideas for children. And I remember Dan telling me in the hospital when we were with Rachel, telling me about these books and how they had, um, and at that point we were, you know, thinking that, okay, like, it's only going to be like, a few, you know, in a, within a few weeks, you know, she'll be home again. And, and I remember her, him telling me, uh, you know, that she was planning on calling me and, 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 and asking if, you know, she could get some, like, advice on how to write a children's book. And, you know, like, after she passed away, I guess like three months, two months after she passed away, um, I was asked to, if I would consider like taking these books and finishing them. And so with this book, the one thing that Dan said that Rachel would be adamant about is that every phrase, every like big and small message have some sort of connection, some sort of theological connection to scripture. And, and so this idea is certainly the most outlined of, of the ideas that she had put down. But um, I, 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 I guess I just took Rachel's concept and tried to stay as true to her ideas as I possibly could. And I, I certainly, I, I colored in the phrasings and I, but every word that she wrote, I can, you know, the one thing that I, 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 I it, and I know that it's, it's, it's weird, maybe. I just wanted to make sure that every word she wrote for this book actually remained in the book. Mm -hmm. And and so that was my that was my goal to ensure to to like I added a whole bunch of words, but every single word she wrote that she thought of every idea, I I made sure they were present in this book. And the we the only thing I changed as is, is, is the title because she had just a working title. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question. Rachel's whole writing career, I mean, the first book she wrote when I, when, when I first met her, it was about being free, getting free to ask questions. And I think that if she had been given the opportunity as a child to ask those questions, um, I feel like she... I mean, I don't. I think that she would have, would have simply wanted and loved to have had the chance, the freedom, to color outside the lines, as a kid, to ask questions, to you know, to to explore concepts that were not like rigid and you know, dogmatic and in, in their presentation. And so, our hope was again in 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 our effort to offer parents a theological storybook that 
that gives you a glimpse of God, but also encourages you to search and ask questions. Like, I think that that is a very beautiful and healthy concept because like, I mean, asking questions is something that is, that so many of people in scripture do. Like, they ask lots of questions and they're directed right to God. And to encourage that, like, to, I, I, I know in my own life, I wish I had had the freedom to ask questions. Um, I would have had a much healthier upbringing. I would have been uh, a, lot, a lot happier a, a, a young adult um, if I had been given the freedom and felt okay asking questions. Because mm-hmm. for me, every single question I asked was a was something I, it was a hurdle that I had to get over. Yes. And, yes. and you know, mm-hmm. like it's, I just, again, I, kids should not have to recover from how we talk about God to them. Like, I mean, God should be a part of the good, a, a, a good part of their story, a hopeful part of their story, a healing, healing part, part of their story. Right, yeah, we've said yeah. the same word at the same moment, yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, what I'm what I'm hearing is this that at least part of the goal of the book is to sort of create a a space or a culture for children to respect the mystery of God. And Absolutely. Not have the you know, the the quick answers that parents sometimes think children need in order to not go down a stray path or something like that. Because there's a lot of fear, right? I mean you, you, I'm sure you know this too. I think what parent doesn't? There's there is fear sometimes involved in. I'm going to screw up my kids, so I better uh. give them these clear boundaries about God, and because we don't want them going to hell. <laughs> you know, when yeah, I laugh, but it's not a funny thing because people are really terrified about that. And um, of course, once you take hell off the table theologically, it, it, it loosens things up a little bit to talk about. But um, just yeah. respecting the mystery, I think, is a really big. You know, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, Matthew, to respect the mystery of God because God is infinite and <laughs> right. I mean, it, just, well, it, it does make to some engage sense. the to to actually be okay yes. in the mystery. Like I, I mean, I, like when I I think about how people that we read about in Scripture engage God, like they didn't have the all the. The, the the concordance and the the, the study Bibles and the, the and all these things like and they the, the, all they had was the mystery hmm. all they had was the 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 thing that the, the 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 echo of the story that had been passed down and I think I think that's the glimpse of God that we're hoping right to give kids like i i want kids to i i and i know rachel would too like i i i want hope that they feel comforted Mm -hmm. that they feel um loved that they but that they don't feel like we are we don't want to tell them exactly what god is like because in the beginning of the book we say because no one has seen all of god because god is far too big for any one person to see and i think that that is um I, I just think that's a beautiful way of of presenting that concept. Yeah. I think that um, this this will this will engage the imagination. This book will engage the imagination, the curiosity, the the beauty, and 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 give parents converse a, a conversation piece to engage in really beautiful conversations about how to talk about God and what to what we believe about God and 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 how those those ideas shift sometimes and that's okay because i think that sometimes you know um especially parents who have like come you know they've started to maybe deconstruct in a later in their parenting years and there's there's this big there's a guilt trip that they put themselves through yeah. because they have they have already told them, told their kids about this one, you know, the this evangelical or this fundamentalism God, and the you know making the shift is is the big thing. And I think this kind of a book is even beautiful in that respect yeah. because it, it's it is so theological, it is so progressive in its approach, and yet it 
it's also really simple. Like there's some, there's, there's simplicity yeah. to it. And I yeah. think that's what is, um, so like easy for me. And like, it was just, it's, it's a easy, easy book for people to connect to, I yeah. think. And you know, th- something that's along those lines, one thing that struck me about the book is the vocabulary. Now, what <sighs> I don't know about children's writing could fit a, fill a warehouse, but I, I do know a little bit about like how many words per page and the kinds of words and how many syllables depending on their age and all that kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and these books are, are, what, four to seven or three to something like that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. But I'm seeing words like passionate, mm-hmm. unpredictable, mm-hmm. persevere. Mm. I, I yep. think those are great words. And I think those might challenge some young children, but that's an opportunity. Oh, see, and that's, and, and you know, I get, that's one of the critiques that I often get about my own books is that I sometimes include words that are too big for children to understand. But my thing is, is I think that big words offers parents a, a moment to stop mm-hmm. and, and, and explain, now, what this, this is what this word means. And I think that that's a really important process of reading. I, like, I think reading to your kids shouldn't be a one-way thing. I think it should be an interactive thing. And so, I always, I like make a point to include words that, they're, that kids are not going to fully understand because it creates this opportunity to have a conversation, to talk about why that word is important and what it means to the story that they're reading or what it means to the, the, the idea about God that they're, meet, they're reading. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I think that we, we like to dumb down things for kids, but I think that it's um, oftentimes I've learned that we don't always, that that's not necessary in, in all things. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of dumbing down things for kids, I probably shouldn't say that, but... <laughs> Uh, let's, let's talk about was, Pete. Uh, no, no. I was going to talk about church. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that we talk about uh, in our house is what our kids learn in Sunday school. And, and there's some really great things. We go to a great church, but there's often things that we want to talk about and try to sort of unpack and say, okay, well, yeah, you know, some people believe that, but other people believe these other things. How do you feel like churches in general can do a better job about educating kids uh, you know, about God, because I think that's a, something that as we go through these faith transitions, there's these institutional things that seem to hold back the conversation. Well, I think that we've, uh, people who have were, were raised in church in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we have been given this, there, there are these essentials <laughs> that we've been given that we have continued, many mm-hmm. of us, to tie ourselves to, like, especially when we're talking to our kids about God, like we, we have a list. And if that list, if that, if, you know, in order to share a story, we want, we, we, we want at least two or three of these essentials to be included, to get the point across, to make, you know, to reiterate Mm -hmm. that what's it, what, what, what's really, when it comes down to it, what really is important and I think that first, I think that you should get rid of a majority of the essentials um, and, or not be so tied or anchored to them. I think that kids can learn about God and learn about how to take care of each other and how to love people who look different than them. And all of these things that Jesus spoke over and over again about like I think that that in order to truly teach those things and teach those things well that we need to stop being stop approaching the stories that we tell our kids with fear and you know or with these like this that we guilt trip ourselves because we are so tied like you know and some of us are like in our process of deconstructing we we may not even believe all of the essentials but we're afraid to present god in any other way to our kids because like what if exactly um mm-hmm. you know and so i think that it's um oh, my thing is, I have like I've thrown out a lot of the rules that I was like. If fear is the 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 you know what is driving me to tell the story, 
or to tell the story in this particular way, mm-hmm. or if you know what what other people think is is driving is the driving force of of what's the the, the story you're telling. If that's it, then I think you're doing it. You're doing a disservice mm-hmm. to the story. Yeah. Okay. So um, I hope the answer to this question had better be yes. Do you plan on writing some more children's books? Yes. Okay, good. Um, do you have any <laughs> plans? Here's something of personal interest. Do, do you have any plans on writing books that might introduce Jesus specifically? Or do yes. You say, okay. no, no. Right. no, no, no. I, I, I really would like to uh i'd like i i would love to write about jesus i am the the, the thing is i've i one of the books i know that the i think the first book that you read of mine pete was when god made the world and that was like the first book where i was really like taking a story you know you know a story from genesis or from scripture and shaping it into a rhyme that fits my style, yeah, right. that whatever. And so it and was. Actually, you uh, read parts of that to me at oh, okay. the first Evolving Faith Conference. Yeah, you're, uh, that's and right. I now. Was I like, and I, I remember get, listening to it and saying, this is really, really good. I mean, you're weaving <laughs> all this stuff together. It was amazing. So, yeah, anyway. Well, I, you know, and so I just, my thing is, is I, when you get to, Telling, retelling stories that are very specific that people that people know, there is this opportunity for to, for it to become really cheesy or really yes yes you you can oh because especially for a rhyming children's book and so like I'm really mindful of that and so like I want to cover Jesus and write about Jesus in a way that I know one of the ideas that one of the the book ideas that Rachel started was a book that was specifically about Jesus. And so I think Mm -hmm. that that will certainly become something that we, we explore potentially. And so I, I definitely want to do that. It's not my next book, but maybe it's the next one after Mm -hmm. that. Maybe now mm -hmm. that I thinking about thinking about that as we, as we wrap up our time here, just any thoughts, I mean, do you, you have a unique perspective in that not only do you write kids books about God, but you are a parent for people who are going through these faith shifts and faith transitions, you know, what words of wisdom might you be able to offer for people who are figuring this stuff out kind of as they go? Um, anything that you've, you've learned that's been helpful to you. Therapy, like deal, deal with your, deal with your spiritual stuff with a therapist I have become a better parent, a better spiritual parent, a better praying parent because I have walked through a whole bunch of stuff and junk with a therapist, who, somebody who has just helped me navigate my story. And some people's stories are less chaotic than mine and some of them are more. Um, some of them involve like extreme abuse and some of that like so all like some of them involve like really really awful theology or really really you know this this great amount of fear like all of those things the one thing about parenting that i have learned is that all of my junk eventually comes out in how i parent it no matter how much i try to hide it or try to like you know keep it under wraps or whatever. So the, the biggest thing when it comes to the, the, the spirituality that you want your kids to see is you dealing with the stuff that is in your own narrative. Mm-hmm. And you find that healthy balance between like what we tell our kids and what we keep from our kids. And, and then you, and you let go of the fear. Um, because like for a long time, um, it was fear, fear of what my parents would think, fear of what, you know, w- you know, what God might think or fear, all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, it was fear that sort of prevented me from just um, exploring an imaginative and creative and uh, uh, a spirituality and a love for God that was full of curiosity and, and, and life and af- affirmation and, and hope. And I, my kids are, uh, you know, so far I see such 
beauty, you know, through the ups and downs of, 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 of my spirituality, their spirituality has, has just been a representation of hope. Not having to unteach anything mm-hmm. is such a powerful, beautiful, healthy thing. That's, that's excellent. I think those are great parting words for everyone to hear because I do know, you know, there's just a lot of uh, uncertainty and probably fear around how to go through these things. You know, again, things that often happen without us even wanting them to happen. You know, questions come. We don't always w- invite them. They are just there. And so, I uh, appreciate those those words of wisdom. So, thanks so much, Matthew, for taking some time and, and coming on the podcast with us and walking us through some of this. Thank you so much. Like, I am honored. Yeah, so. great, great to be with you, man. No, mm-hmm. absolutely. Thank you. All right. We'll keep writing and we'll uh, hopefully see you in the future. Absolutely. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening and supporting our show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. A big shout out to our producers group who support us over on Patreon. They're the reason we're able to keep bringing podcasts and other content to you. So a big thanks to Aaron Clark, Brock Beasley, Dave Carlton, Jeff Hillman, Jerry Lewis, Kevin Marshall, Matt Sutton, Patty Brown, Ryan Morrison, and Tracy Roberts. If you would like to help support the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people, where for as little as $3 a month, you can receive bonus material, be part of an online community, get course discounts, and much more. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Thanks as always to our team, executive producer, Megan Kamick, audio engineer, Dave Gerhardt, creative director, Tessa Stoltz, marketing wizard, Reed Lively, transcriber and community champion, Stephanie Spade, and web developer, Nick Striegel. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening. Children Children's sounds fine. more spiritual. Than I don't kid. care. Okay, fine. I fine. just feel like ch- kids is more vernacular, but yeah, it doesn't seem so haughty. But it doesn't matter. To our yes. children, father, mother, father, <laughs> father and children. I'll retire to the nursery now. <laughs> yeah, let's just a quick intro. Uh, we're just doing Patreon, and that's the, the only in promo. The beginning. Yep, yep, in the beginning. That's it. Okay, yeah. So, nothing nothing too Ugh. hairy here. Patreon. Ugh, that's good for patrons to hear. Yeah. Need you to hear Ugh. that. Ugh. I guess we got to <laughs> do this. <laughs> well, your next one, if you need uh, an artist, I can do clip art. Uh, I, I, will, I will keep I keep you in mind for that. Yeah, I can use, like, PowerPoint really well and do stuff. Oh, so man, if you need he's that. a tech genius. <laughs> I mean... <laughs>